So we're going to write, let's do cos 2 theta times cos 6 theta as a sum. So we have a product and we want to write as a sum. And of course, we're going to use the identities we just got, which are conveniently right above there in your notes, unless you wrote some other stuff in between. So if we go one, two, and three for first, second, third identity on the board, which identity, uh-oh, some of those identities. I want a cos times cos identity. Those are, all have signs in them. Either sine cos or cosine or sine sine. So we'll use this one right at the top of the board there. So let's rewrite that one. I'll write it down here so we know what we can know is cos A plus cos B equals 2 cos a plus b over 2 times cos a minus b over 2. So I'm going to write this as a sum. So what side, what we're beginning with, I'll underline it with a squiggly. What side of our identity is this closer to? I'll give you a hint. There's multiplication in between. That narrows it down really quickly. Left or right? Right side, because it's a product. So let's get the 2 out of there. So that's our first job. So let's get that 2 out. So we'll rewrite this identity. And we'll rewrite it down here so we get 1 half cos a cos b equals Now the substitution that we're going to make on one hand is super obvious, and on the other hand is a little tricky. One of them should be added. So our left side needs to be added. So this should be 1 half. And because we add them, if I just write cos A plus cos B, I need to make sure I multiply a half through the whole thing. Is that font too small? No? All right. Your eyes are a lot younger than mine. So I'm going to make a substitution. 2 theta, I'm going to set equal to a plus b over 2. That might seem a little strange. So I'm going to let 2 theta equal a plus b over 2. And what should 6 theta equal? A minus B over 2. So now I want to know what is A, what is B in terms of theta. So we have two equations in, now it looks like theta is unknown, but what I really want to do is solve for A and B in terms of theta. So theta is just think of it as some constant. So how do I solve for A and B? I have two linear equations, two unknowns. There's generally two ways you learn how to solve that. What are the two? There's three if you count what I taught you in pre-calculus one class. What are the first two ways? Staring at the board waiting for the answer is not going to. And what do we call that? We're, we're solving by what method? Substitution. So we'll solve for one, substitute in the second. What is the other way? Elimination. elimination. So we can substitute, use substitution or elimination. The third way is you can set up in a matrix. We have a constant on one side, A and B on the other. All right, let's solve for, I don't like fractions, let's go ahead and multiply by two on each one. No reason to have. We're solving for A and B, so let's, why have them over two? 
So we got 4 theta equals a plus b. And I'm going to write these two equations right above each other. The other one is 2 times 6, 12 theta equals a minus b. Now we have a system that looks really nice. So I say elimination. We'll just add the two together, and that'll eliminate our b's. The b will cancel the minus b. So we're going to use elimination. So we're going to add 4 plus 12 is a lot. 16 theta equals 2a. So 8 theta equals regular a. So I want you to solve for b right now. Should be super easy. You can either go substitution or you can go back and redo elimination. So we got A is 8 theta, B is negative 4 theta. So any questions on those two? How do you check if you're right? Plug it back in. So if I look, what is A plus B? So I'm going to check in the first 4 theta equals A plus B. What is A, R A plus our B? 8 theta minus 4 theta is 4 theta. So that works. And what is A minus B? 8 theta minus a negative 4 theta is 8 plus 4 theta is 12 theta. So it solves it. All right, so we got A, we got B. All we're going to do now is make a substitution. So this is not, once, once we have that right there, the rest of this is all just substitute back in. So we got So this is 1 half. Well, I'll write the intermediate step. So we got, this is cos A plus B over 2 cos a minus b over 2. Those are the two original substitutions we made. We said 2 theta was a plus b over 2, and 6 theta was a minus b over 2. So now I'm going to use our identity. So this equals cos uh, 1 half cos a plus cos b. And now just putting in the a and b values. So we get cos 8 theta plus cos negative 4 theta. So I'm going to write down your book's answer for this. So there's your book's answer. Why are they the same thing? How did cos negative 4 theta turn into cos regular 4 theta? Yep, cosine's even. So cos negative that stuff is cos regular that stuff. And then, of course, addition is commutative. So you can flip the order around. So I attempted to take those two identities on your midterm right out of the book. I failed on one of them, and I think I, it should have been a, I think I put cotangent, cotangent in there. It should have been cotangent, regular tangent, multiplied together. That would have worked out. Or I think if I maybe flipped a negative sign, it would have worked also on the other side. But I got both of them out of the book. So we're into, that's the end of, it's not the end of algebra, but it is the end of at least this part of algebra. We're going to do graphing next. So this is the next section, 10.5. So 
this is graphing trig functions. And we'll start with graphing cosine. So generally, we've been graphing y equals f of x. Functions look like that. You've got a y coordinate, your vertical, x coordinate, your horizontal. What we've looked at, so we're going to go cosine first. We've generally looked at cosine of an angle, where our angle is not along the x-axis. Our angle measures a rotation from the positive x-axis counterclockwise. So we're going to have to turn uh, an idea about angle measurements. So instead of spiraling, instead of measuring like this, I want to measure that way instead. So things are going to look a little strange for a bit. What is a good way to graph a function you don't know much about? Plot points, plot points and bang on metal. All right, so we're going to plot some points. It's good to look at a domain before we go ahead and start plotting points so we know what points are reasonable to try and which ones are not. So let's, I'm going to let y equal, now I need to use the x variable, not theta. So I want to relate x and y in a graph. So our function is cosine, but we're now relating x and y's. So let's look at the domain. Domain of cosine x. So think about the inputs. Are there any angles cosine can't uh, accept? Meaning, if you think about domain normally, it's divided by 0. Don't do that. And there's no square roots in cosine. So I don't have to worry about square roots of stuff. Think about cosine on the unit circle. Let me erase those two. If we think of cosine on the unit circle, oh, man. So any point in the unit circle, doesn't matter where we are, uh, we're on the unit circle, so I can think of this as cos theta sine theta. That's our point right there. So if you know what theta is, cos theta is where your x value is in the unit circle. So is there any angle in the unit circle that won't have a valid x value? So every single angle in the unit circle has some x value. Even when it's 0, it's no problem. We're going to run into a problem if it is 1 over cosine. Obviously, you can't have 1 over 0. So when we hit the reciprocal trig functions, we'll have a problem. But with regular trig function, no problem at all. So our domain is all real numbers. And we're going to write that as negative infinity to positive infinity. And while we're here, let's write the range. So on the unit circle, it's a little strange because the output of cosine on the unit circle is x. And that's a little confusing because the input for our cosine is also x. So they're treated a little differently. So think about on the unit circle, what is the very largest x value I can have? 1. What's the very smallest x value I can have? Negative 1. You can think 0, but the biggest the smallest negative value you could say is negative 1. Negatives are hard to talk about with big and small because the way we think about big and small. So our range, you can go anywhere from negative 1 to positive 1. And of course, you can hit those two values because they'll be right there. Those are the left and right ends of the unit circle. You, got, you can actually hit negative 1 to positive 1. So, so think, where's negative 1 to positive 1? That would, that would be, uh, 
if I'm talking about not using pi's in the domain, if we think negative 1, pi over 2 is a little bigger than 1, right? It's like 3.14 something something divided by 2. So if I went negative 1 to positive 1 on my domain, I would only be able to choose angles from right inside there. Does that make sense? Like, you can take cosine pi, for example, right? No problem. That's negative 1. So I could write, you know, cos pi, we should all know that's negative 1. So certainly pi is in the domain, if I'm going to write that down. That makes sense. Um, and of course, I can go anything past pi. I can go you know, anywhere. Pi, that particular point on the unit circle is right here. I think you're thinking about uh, theta compared to x. Oh, OK. Because like, if you have like, cos of like 8, we can, you can get that. I guarantee you, whatever cos 8 is, is between negative 1 and positive 1. Okay. It's not going to be anything bigger than 1 or smaller than negative 1. Okay. So no matter what you feed cosine, it's always going to be between negative 1 and positive 1, the output is. Okay. All right, so we got domain and range. Let's go and make our table of values now. So this is called the clueless method of graphing. Now, you might think of the word clueless as sort of insulting, but when I write clueless, all I mean is we don't know what it's going to look like. In the same way we learn how to drive, somebody might tell you what the gas would brake do in your car, but you don't really know until you get in there and start using them, hopefully correctly. So when you first get into a car, you're usually in the middle of a parking lot with nobody around because you're going to do something stupid because you're clueless. I shouldn't say stupid, I should say ignorant. You have no experience. So it'd be really bad if your first time driving a car, you jumped on I-5 and drove to Tacoma. That would be stupid. All right, so what we're going to do is just get some points here. So our input's now x, and our output is take that x and take the cosine of that. So I like to start at 0. We know cosine is 0 is 1. So input 0, output 1. What's our next positive uh, input past 0 that you can think of? And let's think in radians, not degrees. Certainly pi over 2 is in there, but there's a few before pi over 2. So we've got pi over 6, pi over 4, pi over 3, then pi over 2. So we're going to put all those in there, all those four points. Pi over 6, pi over 4, pi over 3, pi over 2. And cosine pi over 6 is square root 3 over 2. Cos pi over 4, 1 over square root 2. Cos pi over 3, 1 half. Cos pi over 2, 0. These could be hard to graph accurately if they're not in decimals. So I'm going to write their decimal approximations. So we'll start with the easy one. What is 1 half as a decimal? All right, 0.5. Wow, 1 over square root 2. So these are going to be irrational. So the best we're going to be able to do is write estimates for these right here. So hopefully I have these written down. I think one is 0.87. The other one's 0.7 something. If one of you take out a calculator or your phone and just type in. So let's go point, uh, we'll round it, 0.71. And how about square root 3 over 2? I think that's 0.87. All right, so we'll write on that 0.87. So we got some pretty good, at least accurate to a tenth. Now, when you're looking at these five points, you might be thinking, well, what about all that pi over 6? What is that in decimal? Turns out it doesn't matter. And here's why. When we go to graph this, so obviously at five points, we're going to plot them out. You've done this part many times. 
So I'm going to plot this out below. So there's our x-axis. Here's our y-axis. Now I'll say that's 1. We know we're not going to go past 1 and past negative 1. So I don't need much y-axis right there. I'm going to need a lot more x-axis. So how big is pi? What number is it close to? 3.14, so let's say 3. So it's close to 3. So what I've done so far, I know how big 1 is. So I'm going to go 3 and a little more that much to the right, and then write pi there. So there's 1. I don't really want to mark off each one. I'm just going to estimate. And let's say that's going to be pretty close to pi right there. So I try to go about three times, a little more than three times as far to the right as I went up. That's not an x value we're using, though. The x values we're using are pi over 2, pi over 3, pi over 4, pi over 6. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit now. If that's pi, where's pi over 2? Very good, halfway. All right, so what half means? So there's pi over 2. Now we have to write down the rest of them. The next easiest one, I think, is probably pi over 4. So pi over 4 is halfway to pi over 2. Now pi over 3 and pi over 6. How to think about those? What's that? Well, remember, if I go halfway, so if, if this is halfway, what would be the value right here? Pi over what? Pi over 8. So that would be a little too small. I want pi over 6. So let's erase that. We saw this on the unit circle by dropping it at twelfths. How many pi over 6s are in pi over 2? So what, what does A need to equal for this to be 3? So there's 3 pi over 6's. So what I'm doing is cutting into thirds. So I'm cutting the pi over 2 into thirds. So we we'll do that carefully. Don't cut pi into thirds. You want to cut pi over 2 into thirds. So it's a little bit. It's very easy for the brain to cut something in half. It is much more difficult to cut into thirds. So do your best. If you really want to get technical, if you cut it into six pieces, you're going to be taking two six, or yeah, two six, two six, two six. That would be a third, third, third. So you could cut it into six pieces. I'm going to delete the sixths and just leave the thirds. So we got a third, another third, and then our last third. And we have pi over 6, pi over 3. And of course, 0, well, it's obviously right on the y-axis there. All right, so we got our five x values. Now I'm going to plot the points. I'm just going to pick the right y value. So first one's easy. Uh, cosine of 0, we said 0, 1 was the first point. The last point, super easy, 2, pi over 2, comma, 0. So now we're going to carefully measure all the other ones. So I need 1 half. And of course, which one was 1 half? That was pi over 3. We're at 1 half. Right there. Pi over 4. Now this is why I went with decimals. So pi over 4, we got 0.71. So it's a little less than 3 quarters. So here's where we're just sort of estimating. And pi over 6 is 0.87. That's almost 9 tenths of the way up. So that's not down very much. So we're going to have those three points. And I think my pi over 3 is a little bit low. Let me boost that up a tiny bit. Now, connect five points together with a smooth curve. So make the curve as smooth as you can, connect them together. So it's just going to be a slowly going down to pi over 2. 
So the curve should look about like that. So questions on plotting those five points. So we got cosine is our function. I could keep going with my table of values, but instead of going on and on with table of values, let's use common sense and some geometric properties to graph the rest of this. I don't want to write out uh, a huge table. You're more than welcome to if you want to. You can do the next five points, the next five points, and the next five points. So cosine, here we are. Well, the angle I drew is already in quadrant two, so it's already past five or two. So think about all your, y, all your x values. We said that x value was zero at the top. That was on our graph down there. That's our last. It's a little strange because when I point to a point here, the x value actually turns into a y value on our graph. And that's a little bit tricky to think about. What happens to cosine as I move it from quadrant one into quadrant two? So what happens to all the x values on this part of the unit circle? They go from all being positive to all being negative. And they go from zero down to negative one. So the output for cosine starts at zero at the top, and the output goes to negative one at the end. So on our graph, we're going to start at 0, and we're going to end at negative 1. So there's our start and end point right there. And this curve, if I graphed out all the points in between, you would see the way it goes. It's going to have a curve that looks really similar to what we just did. And I'll go into red what it does not look like. So it does not go this way. It goes the way I first drew it there. Uh, you can see that happening. Well, if you plot more points, I'm not going to go into exactly why it looks like that. But if you plot some more points, you'll see, like for example, we can do this one very easily right here, very quickly. At 3 pi over 4, we're only at 1 half. So it looks like I went down a little bit too quickly. That should be one half right there. But this is close enough. What happens to cosine after we pass pi? So after we pass pi, when we hit quadrant three, what happens to our x values in quadrant 3. They start at negative 1. Where do we end at the end of quadrant 3? What's our last x value in quadrant 3? So we're going to go from negative 1 back up to 0. And of course that happens at, so there's pi. Let's measure this precisely. We'll go 2 pi and 3 uh, 3 pi over 2. So we're going to hit 0 at the end of quadrant 3, and that's 3 pi over 2. And then we're going to get, at the end of quadrant 4, we're going to be back up to positive 1. So we go from 0 back to uh, positive 1. So it's going to look just like that. Now we said the domain was negative infinity to positive infinity. So of course, 0 to 2 pi is in there, but I can keep going to the right. I can keep going to the left. So what happens after I pass 2 pi? Let's look back at the unit circle. So we're back here at 2 pi. It's also the same place I started at 0 pi. 
So the pattern is exactly going to repeat as I do another lap. So if I go again around the unit circle, we're going to have the exact same cosine values as we go. So we can take what we just drew, and we can repeat it. And I'll do that in blue. So we go from 2 pi, and I'll try to make this accurate, 2 pi to 4 pi. And we're going to end at 1 right there. Halfway in between is 3 pi. And we'll be at negative 1 right there. And we got our 0 and our other 0. So those are the five points right there. And we just make a nice wave right there between these five points. Is 4 pi the biggest value cosine can uh, input? Nope, keep going. So at this point, we're just going to draw an arrow. It's going to keep going in that wave like that. Same thing if I go all the way to the left, I can plug in negative uh, values into cosine. And what happens, I'm just going to spin counterclockwise. So what happens there, you have a very similar function right here. We got negative pi over 2 and et cetera, et cetera. So it, can goes, it goes to the left forever and the right forever. So we have this graph. We'll label some things on it. So this is pretty important. This set of x values, we call this one period. So this is where the pattern is. And of course, one period, we'll call that p, is 2 pi. And we see that right on the graph. After each 2 pi, we're going to repeat whatever values we have. Even at weird values, if I thought about, all right, whatever this number is right here, if I add 2 pi to it, the corresponding 1 would be over there. So if I knew where one of them was, if I add 2 pi, it's going to be the exact same cosine value. So they would have the same y value on this graph right there. So let's write very compactly what I want you to remember about the graph of cosine. So your formula sheet it doesn't have any graphs on it. It doesn't really have anything if you look through it until you get down to vectors, which you may not really know if you haven't looked at vectors before. But it's going to be a while until the cheat sheet is going to help you out in this class again. So you need to memorize starting now for quite a few sections. So your cheat sheet is really only for 10.4, and it will happen again when we get into some of the vector properties that are more tricky. So this, all this you need to memorize here. So I'll write down, we're going to memorize this, hopefully. So y equals cosine x. I'm going to take, I'll make these points super bold right now, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Those points are easy to remember. They got y values of 1, 0, negative 1. So y values are pretty easy to remember. And we're going to write down one period. And all of our periods will go from 0 to, uh, if the period is 2 pi, we'll go 0 to 2 pi. Tangent and cotangent, we'll see the period is just 1 pi. So we're always going to start our graphs at uh, the y-axis right there. So we're going to go one full period. So we got 2 pi right there. Now if that's 2 pi, I need to be careful about how far up and down I go. 2 pi is pretty close to 6. So I'm going to try to go up 1 6 as much as I went over. So that's not very much. We'll go 1 minus 1. That'll be pretty decent. So we started at 1 ended at 1, and now I want to slice the period up into pieces. We got a regular pi there in the middle. We're going to have pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. At pi, we're going to be at negative 1.
and then connect these together with a smooth curve. So there's what I want you to remember from the cosine graph. So I'm not the best at drawing on this surface. I'm much better at drawing with a pencil on paper rather than this plastic thing on this glass cover. So let's look at a more accurate graph. So I'm going to go to Fuplot. Oh, come on. So when you look at this graph, this is a nice waveform right here. Do you see any pies on the x-axis? Nope. Uh, what I do see is I see the last number 6, which is pretty close to 2 pi. So it would be really nice if we can get our x-axis in terms of pies. So I'm going to scroll down to some of the details here. So we go to, let's see, grid spacing. So instead of going negative 6.5, we'll go from 0 to 2 pi. And of course our y's will go, I'm just going to go negative 2 so it doesn't look too tall. No. Negative 2, positive 2. All right, so there is one period right there, but my axis is not labeled nicely. It's labeled in integer, or not integer, it's labeled in decimal, not multiples of pi. So down here, grid spacing, let's go space it out, maybe pi, I'll just go with pi over two. And now we can see things are labeled in pies. It's a little hard to see, without zooming in, but you got pi in the middle and it left out 2 pi on the right, but if I zoom out a little bit, you can see 2 pi. So fooplot.com is going to help you out with graphing. You can graph it, zoom in, change your window, and all that good stuff. And if you don't measure in pies, your x-axis will look a little strange. So make sure you set up your spacing, and that's what they call it, grid spacing. Your x's should be some pi over 2, pi over 4, something like that.